Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is an exciting time for our space agencies to be involved in major efforts in observing the Earth. So this session is really all about observing our planet from space. And indeed, the main theme of, that we'll see in, in the talks that will be presented, unfortunately, all the panel uh, will be done uh, through videos. Uh, but I'll be uh, moderating them and, and uh, indeed uh, uh, talking about each and every one that will be speaking. The main theme is really all about satellites of tomorrow. What are the plans of the space agencies? And in fact, uh, as we describe from our key, with, by our key scientific leaders and administrators uh, of uh, NASA, for instance, and NOAA, uh, what significant advances we'll be making with the new missions I think you'll see the major steps that we'll be making, not only continuing on a series of observations that we've already made, but indeed enhancing that with new observations, not only from government agencies, but also from the commercial sector. So this is an incredibly important partnership that we're gonna talk about. So this session will also describe how we will be managing a lot of this data. What we really want to be able to do is catalyze an ever-increasing set of new users by moving the data into uh, the open science environment. This allows for rapid access. It also allows our scientists to be able to intercompare a variety of data sets, uh, not only for scientific research purposes, but indeed to continue on that long-term monitoring and understanding of how our globe evolves over time. So our first remarks are by the NASA Administrator, Senator Bill Nelson. Now, Bill comes from an incredibly unique perspective. He comes from not only uh, the Senate side working with NASA uh, within that framework for appropriations and therefore understanding over uh, many decades what NASA's program is all about in addition to the other agencies like NOAA and USGS, but, but in a special way, he was on a shuttle mission, STS-61C. Now, this particular shuttle mission uh, indeed had another administrator, Charlie Bolden, another NASA administrator, but he had the opportunity as an astronaut to go and look out of the Coppola. Now, this is an incredibly unique perspective. And in many of the astronauts that I've talked to over, over the years when they come back, there's a common theme that occurs. We call it the overview effect. They observe the globe, our beautiful blue marble, in a sea of black surrounding them in the solar system, orbiting our sun. And, and a powerful urge comes over them to respect this globe, to understand how important it is for life to evolve on this globe in a in a unified manner, in a cooperative manner, uh, where our biosphere is part of the evolution of our planet in a way that allows life to survive over long periods of time. And this deep appreciation he brings back with him, and I would say out of all the administrators I have interacted with, he is our top person that really understands the importance of our earth science activity within NASA and is a champion on climate change research. So without further ado, let's have remarks from the NASA Administrator, Senator Bill Nelson. The Biden-Harris administration is putting the climate crisis at the center of America's foreign policy. The president has been very clear. Climate action requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. NASA researchers, engineers, innovators, and pioneers are answering that call. Bottom line is we can't mitigate climate change unless we can measure it and understand it. And that's what NASA is doing. So right now, this agency is engaged in a broad range of activities. We're tracking the effects of climate change. We're measuring it very precisely. 
and we are actively making that data and knowledge available around the world. A few weeks ago, I announced NASA is exploring a new concept. We're going to set up a mission control center for climate change, and it's going to be accessible not only to those in the room, but to folks that want to dial in virtually. NASA uses a mission control center for every launch and mission. And in the case of the International Space Station, it has a mission control that's 24-7, 365. And that's been going on for two and a half decades. And no less effort should be made to restore Mother Nature's environmental balance. This is not a mission that we can undertake alone, however. It requires a lot of collaboration. It requires uh, reaching out to commercial companies, our international partners as well. Our decisions are going to determine the fate of this planet. So let's act boldly and with urgency. Let's protect it not only for this generation, but let's preserve it for the generations that will follow for years and years. All right, well indeed, indeed you can see his passion really coming through. The, the next uh, video will be done by Dr. Uh, Karen St. Germain, and Karen is the director of the Earth Science Division and the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Under her leadership, 24 Earth Science satellites that NASA manages are orbiting the Earth today and taking observations. But she will be also envisioning a new series of missions that will give us additional views and carry on the long-term uh, tradition of uh, observing the Earth. And these missions are called the Earth System Observatory. So, Karen. Hi, I'm Karen St. Germain, and I'm NASA's Director of Earth Science. I'm delighted to be with you here today to talk about NASA's role in observing our home planet. So when many people think of NASA, they think of human spaceflight or space exploration. They may not think about the work that NASA does to study our home planet. We have a fleet of 23 satellites and sensors that are using that unique vantage point of space to look back at the Earth to look at the land, the oceans, the ice, the atmosphere, and understand not just those individual uh, parts of our Earth system, but also how they interact, how they work together to bring us the Earth system that we understand today. And over the next two years, NASA will be launching nearly another dozen satellites uh, and sensors to give us an even greater understanding of that Earth system. Now, of course, it's not just about the data. The data enables understanding, and understanding gets captured in models, and it's those models that actually allow us to project into the future or to predict. So I'm going to walk you through just one example of how this works. For Gosh, I think it's about 30 years now, since the early 90s, NASA and our domestic partners and international partners have been working together to make sea surface height observations continuously that entire time. The plot on the, on the right shows you the global average sea surface height and how that's been increasing as the climate has warmed. But the, the globe in the center is showing you the individual uh, measurements of sea surface height over time. And what you can see there is, you know, the global average tells you one story, but 
that's those ri that rise in sea surface height is not uniformly distributed around the globe. There are a lot of other factors that play into how the, the global sea level rise will actually impact local communities. In, in, this, uh, in this next slide, I'm going to talk to you about a tool we put together in partnership with the IPCC so that the, the data and the models I showed you on the previous slide feed into the IPCC projections of future sea level rise. But how do we make that real for decision makers? How does, a, how does a person in a local community understand what that global projection is going to mean for them? Well, that's what this tool is intended to do. You can uh, locate your, uh, your, your um, location on the map here. And when you click on it, it will bring up our best estimates of the sea level rise relative to your land level uh, over the coming decades. This allows uh, communities to plan their adaption, their resilience, as well as any mitigation. And, uh, and, and that's really where the power of Earth observation is unleashed. When we can go from Earth observations to actionable information, that's really uh, the, that's the power of science. So now let me take a moment to look to the future. By the end of this decade, NASA will launch the Earth System Observatory. The observatory is comprised of five different missions, all looking at different aspects of the Earth system, but working together as a single observatory. And, and we're doing this uh, differently than we've done these kinds of missions before. We're working with the private sector and our international partners to a much greater degree. And we're doing the science using open science uh, or open source science principles. That means that uh, while we've always made the data available and the scientific results after they've been peer reviewed, in this new era of open source science, we'll share the data as we're doing it. Sorry, the data and the science as we are doing the work. That we think will open uh, the community of, of scientists and users who will participate with us in the science. And we think that's gonna do two things. One is accelerate the scientific discovery and two, um, accelerate the uptake of that science in decision making. Why are we doing that now? Well, if the science of the last 20 years has largely settled the question of what's driving climate change, the science of the next 20 years has really got to be about informing mitigation, adaption, and resilience. By the end of this decade, there'll be nearly another billion people on the planet, and those people will all be counting on us to give them the kind of information they need to prepare for the change we're going to see in the, in the Earth's climate. So we're looking forward to working with uh, international partners, uh, with the private sector, and with users of our data to accelerate the impact that earth science can have in managing the changes to our climate. Thanks very much. All right, next we're gonna to transition to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, or NOAA. And in fact, um, uh, Dr. Stephen Voles, who is um, the Assistant Administrator uh, at the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Systems, uh, also worked at NASA in the Earth Science Division for many years. And I know Stephen uh, quite well. Now, it turns out uh, he's been involved in many different types of missions and activities over his career. Uh, right now, of course, he leads a series of activities that include Earth and solar satellites, 
uh, airplanes and ocean-going science fleets of ships that also have a series of observations coming back from deployed buoys, a huge network of ground-based sensors. He also manages NOAA's extensive data archive and information systems. Now this system manages the data that range not only from climate observations from those satellites and others, but also paleoclimate records. So, Stephen Bowles. Hello. The task before us is clear. Humans are changing the world we live in, in ways that we can't predict, and in ways that place at risk our health and our viability on the planet. We need to understand what is happening, how the earth is changing, and we need to provide our decision makers in our communities with information and options. And we need to do it now. I'm Stephen Voltz, and I work on NOAA's Satellite Observing Systems Program. And I'm going to talk with you about how NOAA, working with many other contributors from around the world, are striving to meet this climate challenge. NOAA is a service agency that focuses on science, service, and stewardship of the environment. We have been in this business for 50 years as an agency, but for hundreds of years longer than that. We observe the environment from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the sun, because it's that holistic view of the environment of the planet that is needed to understand the challenges ahead of us. In that effort, we have satellites and airplanes and fleets and buoys and drones that are making these critical observations. In the space environment, we actually deploy and operate a number of satellites which are focusing observations daily to provide us with critical atmospheric, oceanic, and solar observations needed for weather and space weather. But this is only a fraction of the global observing system that we take a benefit from and draw use from. If you look at the next picture, you see here dozens and dozens of different satellites from multiple agencies around the world that have worked together over the generation to create a global observing system, interconnected and interoperable, which provide the necessary collective information we need to understand the dynamic planet we live on. This has primarily been focused initially on weather and atmospheric services. Meteorology and the weather products we produce are used around the world through organizations such as WMO and others. But it also has been collecting for the past 30 years critical environmental observation as well, which are all key elements of understanding the planet, not just of the atmospheric dynamics, but how the different pieces of the biosphere and the chemicals processes work in our planet. And it's through this network of observations that we're able to produce the information that we have. But when I talk about the satellites and we talk about the atmosphere, one thing we often neglect to include is a focus is understanding of it is more than just what's above ground and more than just the ground. It's the oceans, which are a key indicators of the observations of, of change in our environment that we're trying to track and understand. We collect and maintain a global ocean observing system through NOAA's observations, but also through partnerships in the Global Ocean Observing System, Ocean OBS, and with CEOS, which is a community on Earth observing satellites, which together are able to monitor and observe the surface of the ocean and the depths of the ocean through multiple systems, whether surface buoys, satellite observations, or even um, diving buoys, which drive down 2,000 meters to see the profiles at the temperature and pressure and sensitivity profiles of the oceans on a real-time basis. The scheme on the upper left here shows the transits of where we have observing systems and elements of those pieces. And it's really the challenge of bringing all these together that is critically important. The data we have from these show in the, some of these charts here, the consistent and persistent ocean warming that has been observed in the zero to 700 meter ocean depths that you see here from 95 through 2020 on the bottom left. The CO2 measurements in the atmosphere, the orange chart in the upper right is very familiar to many. But we can also see in the oceans the increase in the carbon dioxide concentration in seawater, the acidification of the ocean increases with the CO2 increase. And other observations of the poles show the sea ice extent dropping year to year on a consistent and alarming basis. These collective observations are really key to understanding the ocean is changing more slowly, but just as significantly as the atmosphere as we see. Collecting these data together and finding a way to collect, to share this wealth of information is done through a number of different UN and other collaborative activities. The World Ocean Database, maintained by NOAA, but with inputs from around the world, and the IOC provide, and the collective availability of these data 
for oceanographic data, in situ data, and the like, for many research and, under, and, and analyses to understand how to track and change and, and, and suggest changes in the way that we operate our systems and how we live in our planet. So the World Ocean Database is a key environmental database for everybody working in the ocean domain to understand how this is affecting our lives and our, and our communities. On the next slide, from another aspect of looking at it from space is that we know that we have to have this partnership with multiple observations and multiple satellites to make the connections and the, to watch the whole Earth. This is a particular projection showing imagery from NOAA satellites over the Americas and the Western Eastern Pacific and our Japanese partners in the Japanese Meteorological Agency showing similar observations over the Western Pacific and Asia. Through careful coordination with our partners in, with JMA, we're able to, to collect these information, these data sets into an interoperable and combined data set of, of the world. And adding to this, our partners on the European side, we now have a synoptic view around the world of a global geostationary observations, which are very useful for understanding the dynamics on a near real-time basis of these many observations. A particular example here showing the combination of JMA's Himawari satellites with NOAA's GOES West satellite allows you to get a look at the temperature variations of the cloud formations. And you can see the, the dark red and black here of storms occurring across the Pacific in real time and tracking these as they monitor, as they move from east to west and from north to south and allowing all of the nations that are in this field of view to benefit from the collective observations of several of our countries. This, collect, this combination is really key to providing the critical information that we all need. In our own hemisphere, in the Americas, NOAA is providing through GeoNetcast Americas a, com a comprehensive selection of observations and environmental data, not just weather, but in, see in this picture in the center here, sea surface temperature, which are useful data sets for fisheries and for ocean management, but also, as you see on the left, a whole collection of information and sources to make resource managers and operators understand how to deal with the systems that were their occurrences in the public health, in fire and hotspot detection, water resource management, et cetera. It's a wealth of information we're able to provide in real time and continuously and with access to historical archive data going back decades to allow managers and resource and, and emergency managers to deal with and understand how to apply, benefit and prepare for um, issues and, and extreme events when they occur. Our partners around the world in Asia and in Europe do the same with their global observations as well. We understand that on the next slide here, that it's not just the observations that are key, but it's making the observations into information so our partners can use those. And is, that is the key nature of the integration challenge that we have. The observing systems on the left on this chart show the many ways we collect data. The process, the information content is the key in the middle to provide knowledge and information in a way that is usable by our many users around the country and around the globe. And this is a, a model that is replicated in other agencies around the world as well. I would say what we're working to do is to create a climate ready communities so that the, the neighborhoods and the communities can respond to this properly. Engaging our users to better understand and meet their needs, not just to give them more data, but understand their applications. Working with our partners to bring in new technologies and new observing systems and maintaining and growing those partnerships, international and commercial, which really are needed to cover the earth, so to speak. This increasing demand for environmental information data products is really what is driven by the climate change. And our response to that climate change is to make sure these data and information are available to all the users, to all the people of the earth. So thank you for listening. And thank you for being a part of the global community that is working together to meet this great challenge. All right. Next, we're going to uh, have a wonderful talk uh, by Virginia Burkett. She is um, in the uh, USGS, United States Geological Society or, uh, Service, and uh, uh, her main role is in the area of Earth observations, uh, particularly from the U.S. Global Change Research Program. So, take it away, Virginia. Hi, I'm Virginia Burkett, Chief Scientist for Climate and Land Use Change with the U.S. Geological Survey. USGS has a long and rich history of ground-based Earth observations, and since 1972, 
we've been working with NASA and many other partners around the world to collect remote sensing data that helps us understand changes and trends in Earth's surface dynamics. USGS is a mission-oriented national government science agency in the US Department of the Interior. Our department manages one out of every five acres of land in the United States, all of the national parks and wildlife refuges, all of the water bottoms of the US Outer Continental Shelf and vast freshwater resources in the US West. Federal and state resource management agencies require a steady, sustained flow of quality earth observations for decision making. Our science and observations enterprise is organized within five mission areas shown here. We provide foundational data sets, monitor natural phenomena, and seek to translate our research on water, geological and biological resources, and natural hazards into information that is actionable by decision makers. The USGS has many different science activities relating to climate change. Examples include climate change monitoring, assessing and modeling of climate change impacts, assessing greenhouse gas sinks and sources, and reconstructing paleoclimates to inform our knowledge of plausible future climate conditions. These two graphics on this slide illustrate our work on the geologic and hydrologic aspects of climate change that informs projections of future changes under different climate scenarios. On the left, our hydrologists use a network of 17 tree ring based reconstructions of drought and stream flow in the upper Missouri River Basin to provide long term context for the current drought. They found that warm temperatures have increasingly influenced the severity of drought events in recent decades. On the right, our climate modelers evaluated projections of snowfall, precipitation, and temperature in the greater Yellowstone watershed. Under each of 20 climate models, the total area dominated by winter snowfall decreases, resulting in a decrease in the amount of water stored as annual snowpack. USGS has long been observing and measuring changes in North American glaciers for roughly six decades, providing the longest continuous stream of data about North American glaciers in existence. The panel on the left shows measured trends in mass balance or the amount of water stored in five glaciers since 1950. The panel on the right shows reconstructions of glacier extent in nine glaciers at Glacier National Park in 1850, shown in that dark gray area of those maps compared to their current extent shown in blue. USGS scientists use several techniques to reconstruct the history and drivers of past wildfires. These include fire scars in trees shown in the center image, as well as charcoal and chemical proxies preserved in sediment cores. The panel on the left shows the increase in area impacted by wildfires in the United States and the expense at wildfire suppression since 1985. The panel on the right shows changes in fire proxies during the last 10,000 years from a sediment core collected in Tibet. In the upper and lower panels, the middle panel showing the reconstructed strength of the Indian summer monsoon. Combining the analysis of paleo vegetation with these other proxy measurements, this work illustrates the long-term impact of climate variability on vegetation and fire frequency. In 1966, the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, announced the first U.S. Earth observation mission that we call Landsat. Secretary Udall announced the new satellite mission that changes, that tracks changes in the Earth's land surface as he said, for the benefit of all. On September 27th, 2021, NASA and the USGS launched Landsat 9, continuing that legacy and gold standard of land use and land cover change monitoring globally. Landsat data are full, free, and open, calibrated to a gold standard of scientific quality and increasingly being processed 
to enable interoperability in cloud-based environments that include open data cubes. Landfire is another practical example of integrating Landsat and other remote sensing and ground-based vegetation, fire, and fuel mapping information. This program is managed by the U.S. Department of the Interior Forest Service and, excuse me, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service and the USGS. Landfire data products facilitate national and regional strategic level planning and reporting of wildfire and natural resource management activities, as well as tactical incident response to large wildland fires. As I also noted, we want to ensure that the science that we undertake can be as useful to those who need it most. And those include people that are impacted by disasters. We do this globally through a longstanding partnership with the US Agency for International Development. This partnership has enabled our Volcano Disaster Assistance, Assistance Program from our volcano observatories to respond to over 70 crises at more than 50 volcanoes around the world, bringing expertise and caches of equipment to bear in support of host country partners. Monitoring a volcano requires scientists to use a variety of techniques that can hear and see activity inside of a volcano. Our Volcano Hazards Program monitors volcanoes to detect signs of change that can forewarn a volcano reawakening. This requires real-time integration of satellite data with in-situ data to help forecast the course of an eruption once unrest is detected. A final example is given here with the U.S. Agency for International Development's Famine Early Warning Systems Network. We call it FUSENET. It's another USGS supported program that informs decision making. In this case, for the purpose of predicting famine and providing an alert for humanitarian efforts. FUSENET uses remote sensing and geospatial analyses of climate and vegetation variables related to crop production to provide early warning of impending food insecure events or situations and to prevent food insecurity, famine, and loss of life. Earth observations and geoscience information that they provide bring great value across the sustainable goals, but none possibly more important than SDG goal 13 on climate action. Climate change is an important element of the work program for GEO, the group on Earth observation, observations, which is a voluntary organization of 113 countries, including the United States, that focuses on the delivery and use of Earth observations for decision-making. GEO has identified four engagement priorities to meet the needs of nations with respect to disaster risk reduction under the Sendai framework, climate action and the Paris Agreement, the UN Sustainable Development Goals under the UN 2030 Agenda, and most recently, a GEO priority is urban resilience and human settlements that supports the UN new urban agenda. Achieving the goals of each of these policy instruments will require the integration of earth observations and fundamental earth science. I like this graphic, which illustrates how environmental understanding is the foundation of all else. Earth observations are creating more sustainable and resilient societies. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you, Virginia. That was um, great. I enjoyed it. Uh, now we're going to also talk about data systems in the area of open sources for observations. Uh, next up is Kevin Murphy, and he's the lead for Earth Science Data Systems in NASA's Earth Science Division in the Science Mission Directorate. Murphy, and I'm here to present to you today um, NASA's plans for open source science. Open source science is really about expanding participation, improving the reproducibility, and accelerating the scientific discovery um, for societal benefit. 
Open science is defined as a collaborative culture enabled by technology that empowers the open sharing of data, information, and knowledge within the scientific community and the wider public to accelerate scientific research and understanding. Critical to this definition is that the technology that we have today is significantly better and allows us for more frictionless collaboration on scientific problems um, to address things like climate change. Now we define this program that we're talking about here as open source science because it extends the open science definition and incorporates principles from open source software development to give a framework for wider participation in the scientific process. So similar to how open source software allowed for greater um, creativity and innovation and participation in the development of critical tools that we use today um, in the internet and, and websites, um, <clears throat> we are going to apply similar types of processes to the scientific process to allow wide participation um, from the inception of missions and research product projects through implementation. So what is open about open source science? Um, it's transparent, which allows the scientific results and processes to be visible, accessible, and reproducible, um, allowing for greater trust in the end results. It's inclusive, um, so it has processes and participants um, are welcome to participate by collaboration with diverse people and organizations. This is especially important as we look at climate change and where um, uh, people need the most critical information to adapt to their new environments. It's accessible, which means that we make the data, the software, the metadata, um, and the tools um, openly and easily accessible for many people to use. Um, this includes journal articles and scientific publications. And finally, um, the gold standard is reproducible science, which again builds trust in the scientific process and allows people to make informed decisions um, <clears throat> Uh, throughout um, communities that need it most. So some of the benefits of open source science are a broad and source of participation and fosters greater collaboration. Um, so we can kind of build new linkages um, among teams and, and with individuals and, and teams to um, uh, support um, lowering the barrier to entry for these activities. Um, this is really important for area uh, groups that have been historically um, unable to participate because as the volume of data and the complexity of data becomes greater and greater um, or model output. Um, it's really important that um, we build those collaborations um, for people to work together with. Um, <clears throat> it increases the diversity of those undertaking these investigations by making them available to people, promotes transparency and reproducibility um, of the scientific process. It shortens the time significantly in terms of how new, new users can find and learn how to use these products, um, increases citations, media attention um, and funding opportunities and enables scaling of large data sets for societal benefit and improve um, uh, what we need to do sometimes in NASA, which is um, our, our improving our data fit uh, system efficiency. As we grow from close to 50 petabytes in our archives of Earth science data today to over 250 petabytes in the next three or four years, um, this is increasingly important. So what it means in terms of expanded use and trust. Um, we enable data access, compute, and analysis to happen side by side. There's often a very um, significant amount of work that's necessary by users to move products or data um, from one location to another to process it. And by utilizing cloud computing um, and open source libraries and software, um, we can allow people to uh, uh, or enable people to really do the work that they need to do without the heavy lifting of data management. And we facilitate this broad and collaborative use of big data collections. Um, so no longer do you have to be a, a large institution or organization or industry to do this work. Um, you can um, access these open uh, capabilities early in the development process and um, <clears throat> start to incorporate them into your workflows and decision making processes much earlier. Um, and we increase the opportunity to use big data to address the climate change for local issues. And that's really critical. So, you know, um, we have data from uh, satellites that support um, global observations, but really the, the day to day decisions, the micro decisions happen um, using information that's based on local issues. And who knows better how to understand and interpret information than those who live in the environment. Um, so we really need to increase the ability for those people to interact with 
and utilize um, our information. So what does this mean in terms of, of kind of how a network of people would work? Typically within um, science endeavors, you have a group of experts that, that sit and work and develop um, um, uh, uh, really, really good products, um, but they do that in kind of a closed way. And what we're trying to do is move from the left-hand side of this uh, diagram to the right-hand side, where we have citizen scientists, we have researchers, we have people within the industry working together within these commercial cloud environments using open source software, open source data, and open documentation to make discoveries faster and easier. <clears throat> now, we understand that the community needs to um, really do a lot to transform into understanding how to use open source science tools and techniques in collaboration activities. Um, for that, to, to support that effort, um, NASA is embarking on a five-year project called TOPS or Transform to Open Science um, to build the capacity, um, engage with partners, and incentivize and help accelerate scientific discovery through these open science practices. Um, we have three primary activities related to this work. First is public engagement, which is um, really designating 2023 as a year of open science, and we're partnering with professional organizations, including people like or organizations like the American Geophysical Union and the European Geophysical Union to do this work. We're also working with high impact journals to see how we can um, ensure that um, publications are free and open for more people. Um, we're working with historically excluded communities um, to ensure that they also have access to this information because they're often the ones that need it most. We're also um, collaborating with GitHub um, to make sure that we document things openly, potentially even developing um, certificate or badges within that organization to support um, a wider adoption. We're building the capacity um, within the community. We're going to translate some of our high value data sets into these cloud optimized data sets so that we can support um, large scale training resources, um, massive online classes, um, summer schools to utilize um, open source science capabilities um, throughout um, uh, you know, um, our user communities um, and with others. Um, and we're also developing a series of incentives, um, including an open source science awards program that really recognizes open source um, uh, science contributions. Um, we're going to leverage prizes and challenges and, and work across NASA um, to develop use cases to do this work. Um, and finally, we're going to increase citizen science activities um, including um, prizes, challenges, and awards to those groups to really recognize um, the participation that we have with them. We're sorry the, uh, the slides and the video didn't quite match up, but hopefully you got the idea of what the new program is all about. So NASA is going to open up uh, its data archives uh, in, a, in an extensive way as best we can through a variety of these fundamental principles that we're going to apply and the project's really going to take off within this next year. And indeed it's going to have an opportunity to be able to get access rapidly to not only satellite observations but ancillary information so important to really understand them and, con and get the context of the data uh, not only globally but locally. All right, our, our final talk is by Dr. Clement uh, Albanet, and um, he is a um, integrated data availability uh, lead at, at um, uh, the European Space Agency, and he's been involved with uh, using a variety of data from JAXA, ESA, and NASA. All right. Hello, I'm Clément Albinet from the European Space Agency, and I will present to you today the NASA is a multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform, the MAP, a science accelerator. The context of this activity was how to make the future of Earth observation users better. We traditionally innovate a lot around the instrument. And the question was how to bring some innovation around the grant segment, around the way we provide the data to the users, the way we interact with the users. And the EO data users are facing today a lot of issues. 
it's not easy for them to share, for example, files of uh, 10 gigabyte uh, with their colleagues. Uh, they want to do things outside of the toolbox which is proposed and they cannot do it. Uh, they want to know if they are working with the latest version of the data. They want to compute data set, but it takes too much time. Um, they don't like sometimes the data that we provide to them and have good ideas to improve it. Uh, and they are facing a lot of issues with storing, handling terabytes of data. And sometimes they, they don't know where to find the validation data to, to validate the results. Space agencies have also lesson learned with the operation of science missions. Uh, indeed, science missions are characterized by new technology, new geoscience, and these have consequences in the exploitation phase. Um, the agencies have to be ready for unexpected aspects with both sensor and data. You need a lot of flexibility of reactivity. You need to exploit the team readiness and imagination. Uh, you have to improve processing algorithm beyond the commissioning phase and for the whole duration of the exploitation phase. So you need a lot of collaboration, open, transparent, you need traceability. And you need to explore new products in particular those associated with secondary mission objectives, yeah, new type of instruments and the new science discovered every day. So you have to be ready for opportunities, you have to be ready to check for synergies. And finally, you want to have scientific discovery of data and products during the mission lifespan. The solution to address all this problem is the concept of mission algorithm and analysis platform. It's a virtual open and collaborative environment that enables researchers to easily discover, process, visualize and analyze large volume of data. It provides tools and infrastructure to bring data into the same coordinate reference frame to enable comparison, analysis, data evaluation and data generation. It provides a version control science algorithm development environment that supports tools, collocated data and processing resources. And finally, it addresses intellectual property and sharing issues related to collaborative algorithm development and sharing of data and algorithms. In addition, this multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform is a collaboration between NASA and ESA. NASA supporting the data and computing resources of the NISAR and GDI mission and ESA providing data and computing resources of the biomass mission. The map has a joint access to data and algorithm and it provides a unified user access to the function of the joint map. It allows to have up-to-date data and algorithm and a collaborative community. The map can be accessed through a web page and provide the traditional functionalities for EO data discovery. You have the possibility to access a catalog to query, search for data and visualize it. Different satellite data can be visualized in different way, can be compared and some statistics can be derived. In addition, the map provides tools for data processing and for developing some codes. Here we have the example with Jupyter Notebook. The development interface allows the users to develop some codes and process large amount of data without the need to download all the data locally on their own machine. The map users have the possibility to provide through a pull request their contribution to the open source projects. The map allows to chain different algorithms in order to generate large amount of data. Finally, thanks to collaborative tools, the users have the possibility to share their work and collaborate with other scientists. All these functionalities allow new approaches in the operation of space mission, starting from initial definition of the algorithm and the first implementation 
of the algorithm of a space mission, users of the map have the possibility to access the source code of this algorithm, to modify them on their workspace, to generate the corresponding data set, to validate the product because they will have access to the validation tool and to the in-situ data, will allow verification and approval of the new official data set by the space agency that will, if the improvement is real, select it to become the new baseline. All of this is possible because it's done within the same environment, which is the map. As a consequence, the processing algorithm evolution is easier as development and implementation are made within the same environment. It allows to arrive faster to stable algorithm, to better product for science mission on a user cooperative approach. And people outside the core science team can contribute to the product improvement cycle. Anybody from PhD students or other scientists can contribute to the space mission products. And this is the concept of open science and it's very well adapted to science as observation missions. One of the examples of this concept is the Biomass Product Algorithm Laboratory. This represents the development of the core algorithm of the ESA Biomass mission. These algorithms are developed today as an open source way using the map. Any user of the map can access the source code, can access the test data set, and is facilitated by all the functionalities of the map. As a conclusion, the NASA ESA map will make connections between data, algorithms, software, and results. The concept of the product algorithm laboratory make it easier to reproduce results and build from existing work. The map encourages collaboration between data scientists and it brings together data from various spaceborne missions from various organizations to support development of global biomass maps. It's a real science accelerator. You can try the map at the address on the bottom right or using the QR code. Okay, well, I hope you had an opportunity to get a glimpse as to uh, what's happening in the future, not only adding to our fleet of spacecraft and how that data will be managed, using modern tools and modern techniques, uh, leveraging the way the space agencies and uh, other government agencies uh, are working together to be able to tackle uh, climate change by providing a significant amount of information that allows our policy and decision makers to make the right decisions and move in the right direction, and then continually monitoring the activities that provide a metric as to how well we're doing uh, into the future. So with that, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we have time perhaps for a few questions. Not sure I can answer uh, some of them uh, relative to the other agencies, but. All right, well, once again, thank you so very much.